Accessing library computer data. And to make sure history never forgets the name, Enterprise. Hey everybody, welcome to the Penske Podcast. You haven't tuned in before, this is a podcast where we are running through all 178 episodes of Star Trek Next Generation, giving our thoughts and feelings about each and every one. Right now we're up to episode 20 of season 7, it's called Journey's End. It was directed by Corey Allen, teleplay goes to Ronald D. Moore. It aired back on March 28th, 1994. In this episode, Wesley Crusher questions his future as the Enterprise is under orders to forcibly remove the descendants of Native Americans, here called Indians, from a planet being yielded to the Cardassians. It's the last appearance of Wesley Crusher on TNG. We've come a long way since season one, huh? Anyway, to uh, sort of, you know, I've been going through these episodes, um, giving everybody their last shot to sort of thematically match the idea that the show is giving all their characters their last shot. Uh, this one is going to be by myself. It'll be sort of a homage to the way the podcast used to be back when I was young uh, and dumb and thought that I could do 178 episodes all by myself. But anyway, I'm going to try to do this one. I'll try to keep it entertaining, try to keep it moving. So let's go. Let's. Uh, we'll talk about Journey's End right after this. Wesley Crusher. Yes? I am Lakanta. It's nice to meet you. Can I get you a drink or something? I have known that you were coming to us for the past two years. Two years ago, I went into the Habak and began a vision quest. And while I was there, I saw many things. Talked to many animals, many spirits. And I saw you. I don't think I understand. I know why you came to us, Wesley. To find the answers that you seek. All right, let's break down Journey's End. Final Wesley Crusher appearance. I did want to say before um, I go too deep, I know people probably shut off the podcast after I stopped uh, talking about the housekeeping stuff at the end, but uh, as we wrap up TNG, I wanted people to know that I'll probably do a last podcast video episode where I want to do like a and a for anything. If I've missed anything that I haven't covered over the past seven seasons, um, if there's some topic you think that you'd like me to hear our thoughts on, something like that, just send a email to the Penske file video at gmail.com the Penske file video at gmail.com and um, I'll try to include it in the Q&A session at the end of it also you can send any kind of suggestions I'll read those for the podcast how the podcast could improve as we move into like TOS and then Deep Space Nine um, so yeah send back any feedback I've gotten some already it's all been great thank you very much for the people who sent that stuff in um, and obviously anything that you guys think of moving forward before we get to the end, feel free to send it in over the next week or two before we wrap up this series. All right, Journey's End. So I think that Journey's End is a better idea than it is an execution. And I think that the Wesley Crusher thing is sort of fitting that his resolution is kind of the failed idea that his character was the entire, the entire series. Um, it's a little bit shocking to me how little I care about Wesley Crusher. He's he's a character that when he's gone, you never really thought about him. And when he comes back, you're like, oh, really? I, I guess. He's, he's oddly the one character I feel should have a resolution or I feel that he deserves a resolution. If you were to lose like the Barkley resolution or the, the Roe Laren that's coming up or the um, anyone else who's sort of been called back to finish off their storyline, I feel like Wesley is the one most deserving of that just because you know he was obviously a main cast member when the show started and i feel like it's appropriate to bring him back i also feel that his storyline here about leaving starfleet makes a lot of sense where the the, the idea that he i mean it ties back into the weakness i guess of the idea that he was always a gifted youth like he's the mozart of his age or whatever the traveler calls him where that always felt 
unbelievable. It didn't feel appropriate for the show. It didn't feel like that was the way that the show wanted to develop. It was a season one idea, so it makes sense that it didn't really fit with how the show would actually develop. But it felt odd. Wesley, to me, has never really shown that. He's good at technology, but he's never really shown anything better than just sort of being technologically adept at anything. He's never had any kind of experience of alternate universes, or he's never really questioned, like, had a weird take on reality, or he has his own sense of ethics or anything. So I never really understood the point where he is supposed to be sort of naturally adept at what the Traveler does. It never came across to me that way, and it feels a little bit weird here. And it also feels weird that we have to bring back the Traveler, who appeared in season one and then came back and, like, remember me for a brief cameo. And he's always felt like a sort of bizarre holdover he's very much a season one idea even his name the traveler it's kind of ridiculous and very much of a season one thing uh where sort of the mythical kind of like superhero character was still a thing that could happen in a day-to-day episode and not be explained away but outside of that i think that you know starting with the first duty episode where we see a little bit of a chink in the armor for wesley it starts to make a lot of sense that he would not be in Starfleet because he's really sort of been pushed into this um, because his skill set was, you know, he's technologically advanced and he's supposed to be the Mozart of his age, but it doesn't really make sense outside of the fact that the show seems to want everybody who's skilled to be in Starfleet. It doesn't make a lot of sense that Wesley's future was in Starfleet. And I think that the episode does a good job of pointing out that he's kind of just chasing his father and also his surrogate father, Picard, because Picard back in season one, rewarded Wesley by sort of putting him as an acting ensign. It, it, was, it didn't seem like it was really something that made sense of rewarding the character and how the character was written. It felt more like it was serving the show and serving sort of this is all that the show would know how to reward somebody by giving them a position in Starfleet. And as season seven is pushing along, it's starting to move into the Deep Space Nine vibe a little bit. It's not really getting there, but it's starting to hint at the fact that there might be life outside of Starfleet and the Federation, which previous to this was not really the case. You'd run into people who weren't part of the Federation, but they either wanted to be left alone or they want to be a part of the Federation. So it's those two kind of things. And the Wesley storyline never really fit any of those things. Like his... His desires always felt a little bit unmet. He's kind of similar in that he's kind of similar to Alexander in that way, who we're going to be talking about shortly. But Wesley and Alexander are, are kind of tragic characters in a way. Like they're, they're characters whose dreams aren't really realized, or at least maybe the characters themselves seems a little bit ignorant to the fact that their dreams aren't being realized. I think Alexander's a little bit more of an extreme case of this, where Wesley at least gets something out of it. Alexander t- gets totally shanked his entire his entire life on the Enterprise. Um, I, I think that the Wesley storyline is just always, it's always been unsure of what it wants to be, and they don't really resolve it here perfectly. They resolve it in a way that makes sense for the character. They call back the Traveler, and they you know he moves on to doing whatever he's going to be doing in his own thing. I think that the weakness of this is the fact that Will Wheaton is a terrible actor, or he was at this point in his career. The way he plays Wesley at the start is basically he's an obnoxious brat who it kind of rubs you the wrong way because you think that if he's supposed to be, you know, becoming a man or whatever they say in the episode, he should be handling this a little bit better. He acts very childish and very bitchy, and Jordy wants to show him his fancy new fucking warp drive thing or whatever, and Wesley just shits all over it. And that scene is also weird because Wesley doesn't seem to have a super knowledge of the warp drive. He quotes like a paper that he read. So it's not like he's even sort of the author of this new interpretation of how to use warp drive or something. He he basically is just being a snob telling Jordy that you should read this paper that I read because it'll change your life or whatever. But it's all that kind of stuff. And I think it's mostly that Will Wheaton can't play the, the role with any subtlety. He's not good at playing this sort of um, put off person without coming across as a little bit pouty. Um, that might actually be a personality thing. I followed him on Twitter for a little bit and he, he seems to be sort of petulant in real life as well. So it might be hard for him to um, play a sort of subtle subtlety in a character where they are conflicted but not wanting to be a douchebag about it. 
that's uh that's me being an armchair psychologist for will wheaton and his uh via his twitter feed which i followed for a few a few days but <laughs> outside of that i think that the the wesley thing it, it all the weakness all stems from that it stems from the will wheaton's inability to play the character right and it stems from the fact that the character himself has always been a little bit underserved in what he wanted and i think that it's interesting that ron moore took the d- direction he did here where wesley wants to leave starfleet something we haven't seen before and i think that's really excellent um i think that was the right move for it, it maybe didn't work out 100 percent, but i think it's the right direction for the character it's the right direction for the show maybe more than the character because it gives us an idea that there is something outside of the federation which is going to tie in nicely to deep space nine in a little bit on the other side of this one, we've got the Native American storyline, which I think I like the storyline, the idea of the storyline just fine. The pro- like, did they have to be Native Americans? Did they have to be Indians? Couldn't they? Couldn't this have been some kind of analogy where they said, you know, this is not dissimilar to the way that we treated Native Americans a couple hundred years ago? It feels really sort of ridiculous that they're Native Americans and they're also this. I'm I'm ignorant too, you know the mythology and the traditions of native americans and the various tribes and everything and you know obviously there are a whole bunch of peoples who are just sort of lumped under one sort of title of native americans but like do they really like do all of them dress like like this seems like a caricature of what the western idea of an indian is it feels really dated it, it probably felt more appropriate back in the early 90s but it feels super dated at this point and i don't understand why they even had to be literally native americans you just make them an alien race or colonists just human colonists who are going to be transplanted um off of this land that they you know they can have some sort of religious aspect or spiritual connection to this planet um you don't need to be an indian or native american to have that kind of spiritual connection they can just be pagans or something like that to um who want to stay on this planet and instead they just they do this thing where they come across with this like caricature of what they're doing. They literally have like a peyote session where Wesley hallucinates and sees it has a spirit sweat or whatever that thing is called um, with the traveler disguised as a Native American. He sees his father. He has a spirit quest or whatever. He speaks to the animals, all that stuff. It feels really odd, although I like the idea. I like the idea of the Federation being stuck in this place where it thinks it's doing the right job and maybe it is doing the right thing by trying to move these people from what is obviously going to be a brutal Cardassian dictatorship over them. This is the, the Federation is doing the right thing here to me, but there is sort of a drawback to it in that people, right, people should be allowed to choose their own destiny and how they want to interact with it and things like that. I think that the Native American aspect is sort of tied in nicely to how they tie in um, Nechea, Admiral, Admiral Nechea, who has the cold open appearance where um, she's been a character who's sort of been the traditional sort of cantankerous, difficult admiral who visits the ship and tells Picard what to do and is always sort of, you know, Starfleet Command is always portrayed as sort of um, unethical and very cold and bureaucratic. And the show does a nice job of flipping that around a little bit. Picard buys her her favorite sandwiches or cookies or something. And she, she reveals that while she can still be a hard ass, she doesn't have a heart of stone because she has tried all the things that Picard is uh, mentioning to bring up. She had already brought them up to Starfleet and been turned down. And she's explaining why that's the case. Um, explains that, you know, she's aware that this is a moral conflict, but Picard has a job to do. And I, I appreciate that scene just because it balances out the sort of morality and ethics that Picard is always going to do where it becomes very one-sided if you constantly portray Starfleet as uh, bureaucratic and unfeeling. I think that it adds a little bit of a dimension to things where, you know, these negotiations with the Cardassians are tough. This is not, it's a typical compromise. Like no one is happy with how things have turned out. The Cardassians aren't happy. Starfleet isn't happy, but They have to make the best of it. They have to move forward in order to sort of maintain the status quo and not go further and further into a strained relationship with the Cardassians. I thought that was really nice. Um, I think that the the show itself, the entire journey's end, is a nice sort of um, nice sort of subtle way of approaching all of these sort of aspects in one 
one way or another. Like there's a lot of the Starfleet is being fleshed out, Wesley's Crusher's journey is being fleshed out, the Maquis sort of underpinnings of what this rebellion um, are sort of being fleshed out. All of that's working out very nice. It's providing a little bit of depth into the Cardassian um, storyline, which is interesting that we meet Gullivec, who is going to be back a few times. I think he's on Deep Space Nine as well. He's this sort of level-headed Cardassian commander, um, sort of typical typical Cardassian fashion, um, willing to go to war, but willing to also prevent it at the same time. That sort of uh, civil barbarity, I guess, that defines all of the Cardassians. And eventually... All of this wraps up into um, a scene where, you know, further being the douchebag, Wesley sort of fucks up everything that the Enterprise is trying to accomplish, which I think is the other weakness of his storyline here. He basically fucks everything up and then just walks away and doesn't have any sort of impact on resolution to the problem. He, you know, he, he betrays Worf and tells the village that they've all come to beam them away. Uh, he puts the away team in danger. He freezes time. The traveler explains that now it's time to go and, you know, do whatever the hell the traveler does in his spare time. And he leaves it up to everyone else to sort of sort out the mess that he's left. And then he just leaves at the end, um, which also felt weird. I feel like he shouldn't see the character again after he's agreed to join the traveler. He should just walk off, right? And maybe say goodbye to his mother and Captain Picard frozen in time and leave knowing that he's sort of fucked everything up and apologizing for it and feeling bad. It would have been, it would have been a little bit more interesting if he just abandoned them at that point and the sort of ultimate selfishness that Wesley Crusher has portrayed the entire time. That's not very TNG, but that would have been nice, I guess. would be That would have been a, an interesting way to end his his storyline. And for a character, is sort of complicated and... Um, with so many sort of different perceptions that the audience has of him, it would have been a nice sort of um, discussion point, I think, but they aren't willing to do that. We see Wesley Crusher in the transporter room. He beams down to the planet because the traveler tells, you know, our typical sort of like the native Americans are wise and they will tell you everything there is to know about the universe. They're very special people, all that stuff. Um, And then we beam off Wesley and that's about the end of the episode. So I do think that this is the, most effective kind of of the character goodbyes it's the one that i feel is most appropriate and it's all right and i think that it works out in terms of the character being kind of wishy-washy and this is going to work out and be a wishy-washy thing i think the episode's bones are better than what it does it it has a lot of good ideas that it kind of fucks up by making them literally native americans by wesley being played incorrectly and things like that i like what's going on though in it and i thought that it was an interesting an interesting sort of development in the show that I hadn't seen in a while and how they wanted to approach these topics about this stuff. And I think that it portrays the conflict with the Cardassians very well. I think that it adds a little bit of depth to the uh, relationship between Starfleet captains and Starfleet command and everything like that. Uh, One additional thing I thought was really stupid was there was no reason for Picard's relative from 500 years ago to have been involved in the Pueblo revolt. That seemed um, like artificial drama. Picard doesn't know him. Um, you know, I, I guess there's this sort of current political mentality or maybe not current, but that people should be responsible for, um, the actions of their ancestors, but I don't think really holds any, you know, I don't think anyone seriously holds that, thinks that argument holds any water, and especially something for further back than we are now, you know, in the, the utopia of the Federation, does Picard really have some kind of guilt over what his relative did almost a century, uh, more than a century, almost like a thousand years ago? It doesn't really make any sense. It felt like it was just added in for drama's sake to make Picard have some kind of stakes or not be as willing to sort of push his hand in this negotiation. Um, it felt kind of just dumb, very pointless to bring up the Pueblo revolt, which uh, I'm staring at now on the Wikipedia page. <laughs> but anyway, I think that's it. I'm going to wrap this one up. I won't play another audio clip. I will play an audio clip. So right after this, I am going to come back and I'm going to give my final thoughts on Journey's End. Captain's Log, Stardate 47755.3. The Enterprise is preparing to leave Dorvan 5, but former cadet Wesley Crusher will be staying behind. Where will you go? The Traveler said that my studies would begin with these people. He said that they're aware of many things. I can learn a lot from them. 
That's just what I need, more studying. <laughs> Somehow I think you'll manage. Me too. Well, good luck, mister. Good luck, Wesley. Thank you. For a lot of things. All right, everybody, so let's get into our final thoughts and ratings for Journey's End. We're nearing our Journey's End of TNG, and this is the, uh, there's only a couple episodes left. We said goodbye to Wesley Crusher. We did all that stuff. We talked about the strengths and the weaknesses of this episode. I'm going to give this one a three. I think it's a pretty, I think it's a fairly solid episode. I don't think it's entirely problematic. I think there's a way this is that they could have improved stuff, but I don't really hold it against the episode. I, I enjoyed it. Um, in spite of itself, I guess I, I feel that the I don't find the Wesley Crusher resolution very satisfying. Although from a nostalgic point of view, I do find his storyline ending to be fitting. Um, like that, I find more appealing than the actual nuts and bolts of what went on. He's kind of been a failed character the entire time. The show never really knew what to do with him. They never really knew what the best way to go about handling the character was. They never understood the weaknesses and the strengths of the actor playing him and how that could feed into it. We, he left in season four. We didn't really care. It didn't It didn't feel bad. It didn't feel like we missed him. It didn't feel like the show suffered anything. It felt right. And I think that him leaving here is appropriate for the show ending. It feels right. I don't think it ever really kind of had to be this way. Maybe they didn't nail it 100%. But I think it's a pretty solid episode of Star Trek that has good bones, has good intentions, has a couple good ideas that it's trying to deal with. And I think it comes across well. It's a good universe building episode i think that's it i'm going to give this one a three so remember guys uh, to send in your questions for the q a do that at the penske file video at gmail.com otherwise all the usual stuff if you're on uh, youtube like in the comments appreciate it itunes rating review or you can rate us on all your favorite podcatchers like stitcher and all those things facebook.com slash the penske podcast you can go there you can also go to patreon.com slash the penske podcast we just released highlighter to two our exclusive uh, patreon content which we do a couple times a month uh, to people who give $2 a month on the Patreon. We just got done, Clay and I, talking Highlander 2, good hour and a half discussion about what is regarded as one of the worst movies of all time. So you should check that out if you're not a patron. If you are, thank you, patrons. You make the show possible. Guys, I'm looking forward to wrapping up Season 7. We're going to be back in a couple days with Modi Operandis. He and I are going to be talking Firstborn, which is the fond farewell to Alexander Rojanko. All right, guys, see you.